Welcome back to Simon & White and the podcast at the Crossroads, Business, Media, and Politics. I'm Christian Whiten, joined as always by Mark Simon. Mark, uh, joining us from Taipei today, I believe. Taipei, yes, up in beautiful Yanming Shan. One more day of quarantine, uh, only three days now. And uh, I must say, it's, it's, it's not awful. If you're going to come over, I encourage people to come over uh, on like a, a Thursday. Then you got Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday you're walking into the office. You know, and I'm lucky I have I have a place here. So, you know, I have a place to stay. Good. Well, you know, the only place in Asia I've been in nearly three years now is Singapore, which is pretty good in January, but hoping to get to Taipei and Tokyo later this year. Speaking of Taiwan, there have been rumors yes. for a while that uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was going to go. And Pelosi is someone who's likely out of Congress uh, this year. She's been there forever. Democrats are likely to lose control of the House. I doubt she wants to sit around and be minority leader again. So uh, this is someone who definitively can go to Taiwan. She'd be the first sitting speaker to do so since Newt Gingrich. And I guess it would have been 96. Um, but Joe Biden came out just uh, today and said, well, she probably shouldn't go. The military, according to Biden, said that she shouldn't. I find that hard to believe. Uh, Mark, what do you think is going on here? Do you think Pelosi is going to take Biden's advice? Um, well, first of all, you know, being in Taiwan, the first thing I do is, you know, I talk to people and see people, um, you know, uh, and, you know, when you talk to folks, the Pelosi trip was a done deal. In, in fact, we did know that they were actually, there were other people that weren't, they were basically moving around and other congressional delegations that probably would have showed up during that time, but to, chose not, you know, in other words, you're not gonna, you're not gonna spike the uh, secretary, I mean, the speaker of the house. So I do think very clearly at this point in time, she was coming. I mean, people told me it was a done deal in their minds. She said, look, last time it happened, I'm going to make it up for this time. And, you know, I went to bed and this morning I woke up, you know, got up around 6.15, a little bit of jet lag, started walking around, didn't check the phone right away. And then the phone started ringing. I go, oh, that must be the wife. No, it was a producer at a local television station who I know, Mark, did you see the Biden news? And I had to look it up and I go, oh, my God. And I said, well, call me back in five minutes and I'll talk to you. And then by the, in that time, two other people called you know, the morning, you know, you know, reporters, they're in a panic over here. They're really, it's really scaring people because basically this is incredibly important. People have talked about how China could cut Taiwan off by not going to war. Well, if Pelosi doesn't go, this proves the point. All they got to do is threaten and Joe Biden backs down. They have just literally shut up, shut down Taiwan. And to watch people literally fall off their, their chairs trying to defend this is unbelievable. I mean, you've got the usual pro-China scumbags in D.C. saying, well, you know, it was all grandstanding. It wasn't grandstanding. She's the Speaker of the House. She wanted to come to visit a very important country. It's her last term. She could have come. The Chinese could have raised hell. But no, it looks like they really were threatening to put those jets up there and maybe escort her down because, you know, her regular flight pattern would come, you know, down from, you know, Great Circle. That's how you'd usually come. Now, maybe what they would have done now is they'd have sent her via Guam. In other words, she flies down to, she leaves San Francisco, flies to Guam, and then flies up. That would be harder for the Chinese to intercept, but they'd have to bring tankers around and refuel the planes, which would, you know, really raise the temperature. But the fact of the matter is, once the speaker says she's going and she runs it by the White House, which she certainly probably did, cannot imagine that it was not run by them. And they said, yes, it's a yes. So here's Biden one more time. And, and I have to say the most unpresidential statements I've seen, literally the way it was reported from Bloomberg to CBS was almost in disbelief that he was that he was doing this. This is a very big deal not because Pelosi's not coming, but because basically they've gave, given the Chinese the veto on what goes in or out of Taiwan. 
All right. You know, it's weird. It's a little bit like the administration's negotiating with Iran. It's not just one sort of stroke of appeasement and they're done. They've been negotiating from a position of weakness for a long time. And same with China. They've been talking for months now. It's like been at least three months since Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, said, well, we're probably going to cut some of these tariffs on China. Uh, they haven't done it yet. Everyone expects them to. It's this slow motion, just appeasement. You know, one other thing about Pelosi, I've been a critic, of course, but she's been pretty good on China uh, long good. before the rest of her caucus yes. or Republicans. She was tough. She uh, carried the torch on Tibet issues. Um, if our memory recalls, she uh, met with Jimmy Lai. Uh, I'm sure she's met with the Dalai Lama. Um, she's been, been I, pretty I, tough. I have been, in, I have been in, I have been in Speaker Pelosi's office when she was the speaker and when she was the minority on Hong Kong and China probably six times because I've been with Cardinals in three times and uh, other people other times. And, you know, I actually I actually um, ambushed her uh, in D.C. Uh, in the in the in the four year of the uh, four seasons in Georgetown. She was walking by and it was 2019. And I said, Madam Speaker, thank you for your help on Hong Kong. The Hong Kong people, we really appreciate it. And she looks at me, this big white guy going, the Hong Kong people, we really appreciate it. <laughs> she looks at me. And then she turns around and she sees the two other gentlemen who are standing with me, who she goes, okay, they're Chinese. And she comes over and she said, hi, how are you? Well, thank you so much. And I said, Ms. Pelosi, my name is Mark Simon. I work for Jimmy Lai. I'm friends with, you know, these other people, you know, if you, re I, I'm sure you don't remember, but I came to your office with Cardinal Zinn a few times. So right then and there, you know, we had this lovely conversation and she's up to date. That was the thing that kind of amazed me. She was up to date with the number of people that had marched in the streets. This was before the violence started. She was up to date with it and she mm. knew it was going on and she had been briefed on it. And then an hour and a half later, I get a phone call that says she would love to see you absolutely and see with people you're with but she is flying this afternoon at three o'clock to europe or something like that it was a, it was a little, completely legitimate excuse you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and she is the speaker of the freaking house so you know what i'm saying right. you know that's part of life so that she was tough on china i mean she's from san francisco but you know so silicon valley adjacent and of course some of those ceos actually live in the city itself so they were uh, all smoochy smoochy and remain so with China, with the CCP. Also, I think her district includes Chinatown and San Francisco. I could be wrong. I lived in San Francisco for a year. I got the impression that Chinatown itself leaned a little bit more mainland, that the pro-Taiwan um, um, folks are out in the East Bay, but I could be wrong. You're not wrong. Lately, it has been very pro-China. They've had their people there, but the Taiwanese have a tremendous... Uh, a tremendous, uh, uh, a tremendous presence there. I'm trying to think of the people that own the San Francisco Chronicle Chinese family. The Fongs, I want to say, is the name. I met them one time with Jimmy. Um, so San Francisco is pretty old school Chinese, you know, area. I mean, this is where they basically the original immigrants, not to say originally, but the immigrants, the mass first mass wave settled in, settled in there. They're incredibly well integrated. You know, you have as much chance of getting pulled over by a a Chinese American policeman, as you do a white American policeman, in a, in in there, um, in in San Francisco. But she's always been good. She's always cared deeply about the issue. And here's the whole thing. I think she's actually understood the communist better than most people. Some people just don't get them. They really don't. I mean, I am so you, my mind just switches off when people go, oh. I can't imagine why the Chinese would do that. And you're going like, because they are communist. You know, I mean, <laughs> that's what they do. That's how they stay in business. And, and, and it's hard. It's really hard on people to understand that. Pelosi is a, she's, you know what? Who's closer to Trump, Pelosi or Biden? Pelosi. It's like AOC. They're all the same cut. She's an East Coast girl who happens to be in San Francisco. Her father was a, Italian politician, mayor of Baltimore. You know what I'm saying? She married this tough Italian guy. They moved to San Francisco. Her husband's a pretty nice guy. I've met him too. Also a very good investor. And so the thing with her is, is that, look, 
She's good. She's really good. And it's amazing. And I know what she happens to think of some of the other Democrats who are a little pro-China. Very, very. She ain't, she, she ain't shy about it. Not at all. Very good. Well, uh, yeah, it seems to have been exceptional, though, you know, frankly, just the reality of what the Chinese have been up to this last decade or so. As it dawns on more members of Congress, there are fewer panda huggers out there. Let's stick with China on the business issue. There seems to be something going on up there, very significant, that as it turns out, people who were promised, um, I guess, condos, if they call them not apartments, houses in some cases, uh, who were paying uh, and the construction on these has been halted. So um, you have all of these real estate developers who are in a politically favored class who um, you know, have been part of this, this rampant buildup um, in China, probably excessive uh, infrastructure. And these people have gotten tired of paying for homes that they don't appear to be about yes. to live in anytime soon. And it's not just a few people. It's a big movement. It's gotten the attention of the government, the, the attention of the international media. And it seems to be a real problem for Xi Jinping. And uh, is it a political problem? Is it for real? Is it just a speed bump? Is it a for real? And also financially. I mean, so much of the Chinese economy is, in fact, based on this real estate development. Is there a possible Lehman Brothers moment on the horizon? There's a guy named Bill Bishop who writes Sinocism, and I think Bill's, you know, we're politically different in many ways, but he's got a very good take on this. Um, I have been watching these black swan events in China for years. Uh, there seems to be uh, always a desire to watch them um, undertake, uh, to watch them undertake um you know, some type of suicidal run or something like that that they're going to do. Look, they have an ability because they're a totalitarian regime that has basically still positive foreign currency cash flows for the most part. In other words, they've got enough money coming in from exports and taxes and things like that. I think they'll be able to weather this at this point in time because I think we're we're paying attention because um, we're paying attention because the question is, as you see some public protest, you see people in the street with the Hainan, bank, Hainan banks, but I'm not certain that the Chinese people are really going to rise up over this. And I, that's kind of my, that's kind of my only, the only measurement I have. Is this going to change the structure of the CCP? Not get rid of the CCP, but change the structure. At this point in time, my answer is no. Two, two caveats. The first is we've seen now the suppliers have decided they're not paying. In other words, the homeowners are saying, I'm not paying you, mm -hmm. you made loans back. Well, now the suppliers are saying, well, you know all that concrete and steel and that wood that I was paying for to build things. I'm not paying that back either because the developer's not paying me. So in other words, now we're down to a second level where the bank manager was pulling his hair out once before. And that's it. So the government can in some way bail out the the retail people, the people on the other end, if they do that effectively, if they do that efficiently, maybe the suppliers get paid. If they don't, the suppliers are then like the first wave is the uh, is the buyers, second wave is the suppliers. But then the real thing to me is, what if they stop paying the labor? And they have stopped in some cases. And that's what heats things up very, very quickly if they're not paying the workers. Now, generally, they will move heaven and earth to pay those workers to keep them off the street. But if they can't do it efficiently and if it's happening across the board, that's it. Look, China's all about wealth. In other words, in, in terms of property, there's been this bargain that they've had that my flat will keep getting more valuable every year. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of like in America when people in 2005, you know, great story. My dad was on the porch and all the guys were sitting around, you know, they're all these young guys, they're going like, Oh, you know, I made this investment and that investment. You know, real estate's really, you know, making a lot of money for me. And my dad looked this the guy. He goes, "Real estate hasn't done a damn thing." Alan Greenspan's making you rich, and you. Know what I mean? <laughs> and I was like, I looked at my father, and I go, "I didn't expect that from you." But actually, he was. You know, that was the one area he never really followed, and he's right. He was right. And so the thing is, is that, um, I I, I think that right now, no. But I think it's really a bad sign. And the final thing I'll leave on that is demographics. I think we're really starting to see, in other words, the back 
stage trend that we're really starting to see here is mm -hmm. demographics. They're not having enough sex and producing enough babies in China, which I know, <laughs> you know, is, 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 is hard to do, um, not hard to imagine, but they're just not, there's not enough kids. It's, it's falling apart. It's falling apart quickly that there's no big families. There's no anything. And I, I think, I think we're going to see that. You're just going to see, it's going to be like one of those old Western towns in the 1918s or 1920s where people just, certain towns are going to start to leave and they're not going to repopulate because you don't have the population. It's a real issue. Demographics is the issue for Asia. I don't care what anybody else says. You know, um, going back to San Francisco and China, there's a bar, a nice piano bar at the top of Knob Hill, the four something. And you go in the bathroom there and uh, it was Chinatown, but it's just all of the opium dens and brothels. It's a map from the 19th century. So they were having enough sex then, I guess, you know, back in the uh, mother country in China, not the case anymore. Um, how big of a portion of the economy is real estate there? I mean, you just, it's, uh, you said there's this group of people who viewed it as sort of, I, you know, I, the retirement plan. I, I think plan, in the terms of plan. personal wealth, I think in terms of personal wealth, it's at least 50, 60%. Gav, Gavacol wow. is pretty good. At it's, it's hard to determine because they basically hide their money very quickly. You know, in other words, in, in China, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons I like gold, but I always tell people if there ever becomes a time to sell gold, you're going to see gold come out of places that you've never seen before. You know what I'm saying? The Chinese. So it's hard to determine their net worth. It's very difficult. What we know about their public net worth mostly is real estate. Of course, there are shares and stocks and things like that. But really, for the average person, it's, it's the, the, as, as in the U.S., the home is the largest part of their, their, their real estate portfolio. But then, unlike the U.S., the wealthy, wealthy, wealthy people in the U.S. own stocks, shares, businesses, yeah, a little bit of real estate or something like that. But it's, it's basically what I would call productive income. Mm -hmm. Whereas in China, they're just basically socking it away. You know, it's the reason why you see overseas, like what we call the black money show up. Like Canada's got a massive inflow of money coming in. In fact, they're now, ta they tax foreign buyers. And I happen to know this because the company that I oversee, you know, the company I run, we oversee that basically we're, you know, when you, we buy land, because even though we're Hong Kong, you got to pay a 10% surcharge. Wow. And and they're raising it to 20. I think it may already be raised to 20. And so, the, but the money still flows in because they're just trying to get it out. So they have a different view that we do of it. But I, I think essentially, boy, I'll tell you, um, I, I, that's the whole thing with Xi Jinping. I just really think that he is as blinders on and doesn't know what he's doing with this whole, uh, with this whole, with the entire uh, economy around. I think real estate is really set for a uh, a big drop in China. It's already dropping, but I don't know if it's going to bring on what we're hoping or what we're looking for. You know, mm -hmm. changes in structures of government. All right, and before we uh, go back to one final China story, I want to shift to Japan. Uh, hosted a panel at the Center for the National Interest with Nabe Watanabe and Steve Yates. And Nabe is a longtime um, analyst and onlooker in Tokyo. He's with the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Broke a piece of news I hadn't seen, at least not in the English language news about Japan, which is that they're thinking of going, it'll take several years, but potentially up to around 2% of GDP on defense. For the longest time, they had this unofficial peg of, of 1%. Um, America spends between three and five, depending on what's going on in the world. Um, and they've crept up a little bit, but they're still only about 1.1, 1.2. Going to 2% would be a pretty big deal. And this is happening at a time, I mean, Japan is likely in recession now. It hasn't been officially declared, but the economy is slowing or has slowed. Uh, the yen is in the toilet. You can get something like 135 yen for a dollar. Normal is between, I'd say, 110 and 120. Uh, you mentioned demographics, demographics not going well, uh, but frankly, they ought to spend more on defense, uh, especially if even if we're spending high levels, they, we still seem to be spending it in Europe and the Middle East. Um, but I don't know. Does this strike you as, as credible? Um, and do you think the Japanese would spend it in a, in a smart way, smarter than we are? I mean, they're not going to do nation building in the I mean, Middle East, but. What, what's your opinion of the state of the Japanese self-defense forces? I mean, what's your what's your state? What's your opinion in terms of. You know, you, you follow that much closer than I do. I, I have a thought on it, though. What's your opinion on these things? What do you think? My guess is it's pretty decent. I'm always worried about the Japanese lack of flexibility and sort of corporate 
um, hierarchy. I mean, militaries have hierarchies, of course, it's what they are. But, um, you know, this is the problem with it's, it's sort of the big question mark over China, too. They haven't been to war since, is it 78, 79, when they had that little war with Vietnam that they lost, essentially, um, fought us in Korea uh, and, you know, outnumbered us massively. And we fought them to a stalemate. With Japan, um, it seems like their Navy has some decent stuff. You know, they have helicopter carriers that in European navies would be considered aircraft carriers. So I would imagine they would do actually a pretty competent job, um, you know, with the tasks that they were assigned. But the, I, I don't see them as as really extensive and, uh, you know, ability to put three different task force in the uh, uh, China Sea or uh, anywhere in the Western Pacific at any given time or to operate that independently of the U.S. I tend to agree with you. I, I tend to think they're a lot better than people think they are. Um, they've got the F-35s. They've got the drones. They've got all the missiles. You know what I'm saying? Um, they see China as a threat. They really do see China as a threat. Um, getting back to this whole Biden thing, I I think this will be a, I think this will be a, uh, uh, I think this will be a, uh, uh, seen in Japan as a major pullback. In other words, a lot of the people that we see, the Americans don't have it. Now, when you're a shrinking country demographically, what do you have to do? You have to buy weapons that don't need people. So in other words, surface ships that need large support staffs, maybe not so much. Maybe what did somebody told me one time, they said for every Aegis destroyer, you can have two submarines in terms of the support crew and things like that. So just because the size of the crews and the, the split flips and things like that. Now, I think the submarines are more expensive I'm, you know, in the ages. But but the point is, is like they're going to be looking for weapon systems that don't take people. And that means high automation. That means high dollar. You know, so, uh, 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 a sophisticated missile launching system costs more than a guy throwing a rock. And that's, you know, if you have but if you have enough guys throwing rocks. You don't need a sophisticated missile system. <laughs> so they, I, I, think, I think they have to spend. Um, when I left the last time I was here in Taiwan, I have a little group that I meet up with every once in a while. They have the same thing. You know, I've got this whole dream in my mind about, you know, I listen to these guys talk. And, you know, it seems like I, 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 seem, I see Chai, Chai up there, you know, one day if the Chinese ever coming over, she's like the wicked witch. You know, she'll have instead of instead of the monkeys flying, she'll have drones and she'll be going, fly, my pretties, fly, fly. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, and 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 it takes that takes technology and innovation. And I think that's why people are watching the Ukrainian battlefield so much now. In other words, what we see is like we take all this money to move a 155 over there and a, uh, you know, a one hundred and fifty thousand dollar you know, Russian drone flies over it twice, drops two bombs and takes it out with all the ammunition. So, you know, drop and, you know, drop Simtex or whatever the hell they're dropping. But I think the Japanese see the threat much more than we do. I think they deal with it every day in their waters. I think every time they get up, they see Chinese ships. Look, the one thing about the Chinese is, and, and I'll be blunt with the Chinese military is stupid. I mean, they are not, they are like, Big, they're like they're like in a bad children's movie, a bad teen movie. They're like Biff, okay, <laughs> in Back to the Future. That is the mm -hmm. Chinese military. They're big, they're strong, but they're as dumb as stones. Their behavior internationally is so bad. You know, recently they've dropped flares in front of an Australian aircraft. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, I've heard from two commercial pilots that they said they see these guys coming up and they're flying right towards them. And they said, they get a little tingle, they get a little worried, and then they veer away. You know, they don't follow anything in the water. Look what they do down in the Philippines. You've got this basically pirate fleet, their, their maritime merchant fleet down in the South China Sea running around. They are bullies. And the reason why they are bullies is because no one has stood up to them. The way you stand up to them is you be smart, quick, and fast. And I think that's what the Japanese are looking to do. That's what the Taiwanese certainly have to do. You're not, and so that takes money. Now, what this Japanese budget does tell me is a place I'm sitting right here, beautiful Taipei, you know, a, a 10 or 15 kilometers from where I sit, sits the president and the defense minister and everybody else. 
And what do they spend in Taiwan? Not even 2% of the budget. Right. It's uh, and, and, and so, right. you know, you know, so it's like they're saying, well, we can't. And I go, well, you can if you develop things. You can do things. I mean, somebody, you sent me the thing the other day where they had this big announcement, 500 <laughs> pistols. It's like 500 <laughs> pistols. The Chicago Police Department, and they're not... And they're not any good. They order more guns than that in a year. <laughs> 500 right. pistols. Like the Wichita by the way, Police Department. Or something. By the way, I have actually seen the guys, I call them LARPers, the guys who are going out and they're trying to learn like tactics in case they have to fight the oncoming Chinese. God bless these guys. You know what I'm saying? They, I know what they want to do, but they're running around with airsoft guns. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and th there is no... There is no, there is no, there is no incorporation of anything. But no, really, I, I do firmly believe that what we're seeing here in the, uh, in, in the, in not the abstract, but in, in the real life moving forward with Japan is, they know they have to spend more money. They don't, they know they don't have the people to do it, and I think they're going to start seeing things. And I have to say, I'm starting to believe. I don't think the Taiwan submarines are the answer, but I think the Japanese are probably going to see some more submarines. Well, that and that occurred to me while you were talking. One thing where they could really make a difference is with electrics, di uh, diesel electric subs. Ours are all nuclear. You know, our Navy makes a good point that we have to cross an entire ocean, whether it's the Atlantic or the Pacific, before we can really engage. Yeah. Um, you know, the value in a sub is keeping it submerged basically from the minute it leaves a U.S. port. Um, but if you can, you can get greater numbers if you don't need to pay for nuclear reactors and everything, all the infrastructure that goes along with that. And also, I might you know more about this being a, a, a maritime guy, but um, with a nuclear powered sub, I gather you're always running some equipment because even if the reactor shut down, you still run the uh, coolant or you still run the, yeah, the, the cooling uh, machinery because of decay it still p puts off some heat. Whereas with an electric sub, you can turn off everything and just lurk. Uh, and the ability yeah, to look. make people worry about what is hanging out in the Taiwan Strait should be a pretty big deterrent. Well, the, 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 the Japanese electric sub, I mean electric boats, the Japanese diesel boats, I understand are quite good because they're Japanese. Let's just face it. They make Toyotas. They make Lexuses, you know. Um, <laughs> the Russian Kilo submarine, which is their, you know, their top export, their top electric boat, um, and always is very well respected. I've been out of the Navy, working for the Navy for a little while now, so I don't know. I, ha I have heard that their export models are pretty crappy because they don't put anything in it. And they're de as we're seeing with Ukraine right now, they're, you know, they basically, their industry is a little bit corrupt. I fully agree with you. I think if the Japanese would just say, look, we're going to turn out, you know, another 12 electric submarines. They're going to come out there. Basically, you've now changed that. You've changed that. I'm a firm believer right now. I'm, I'm really a, a firm believer that, um, the Chinese aren't getting across the strait as long as comm sub pack fleet and even what the Japanese have now are out there. The Chinese have no ability to do anti-submarine warfare off their shore. None. You have to sure. do anti-submarine warfare. You're, they're not going to have control of the seas. They're not going to be able. It's not like World War II, you know, where Clark Gable puts down the bed and says, there's a destroyer to the left. There's a destroyer to the left. That doesn't happen anymore. You're going to have to fly <laughs> over them. You have to look at you. They use satellites. They'll use everything, but they don't have that ability. And so, essentially, you're going to have at the top of the Taiwan Strait. You could have three USSNs, and you know, it could look like a parking lot for submarines up there. The Chinese can't find them, you know, and they're launching within 30 minutes. They're launching 12 missiles or 14 tomahawks, and you know, if you've got three launching, you've got 36 missiles, pretty high, highly accurate coming, you know, at any Chinese amphibious fleet coming in, plus what the Taiwanese are launching. So I think it's a lot tougher than people people think. In other words, there's a we've got a we've got a carrier killer for the aircraft. Fine. The aircraft carrier is going to be 500 miles west of uh, or 500 miles east of Taiwan, you know, doing zigzags and you never find it. Mm -hmm. But the uh, the uh, submarines are never going to find so I, I, that's why the Taiwanese, I mean, you, you hear the Taiwanese talk about it. They really want more submarines. The problem is, for me with the Taiwanese, is, is that, how would I say? The problem is that it's just too, they late and a dollar short. They, it's too late now for yeah. them to do it. 
You know, right, they, need, right. they, they need they need missiles. They need mobile launchers. They need M one oh nines. They need I think they need M one oh nines. They need they need real things that basically can show up in a year, you know, and that's the problem. They don't really they don't really push these things the way they should, you know. Right. All right. One last question on China, just to round out the episode before we go to get your quick reaction. Uh, just news today from Bloomberg. Excuse me. I think it was actually from the AP that says um, that China, for the first time since 2010, has less than a trillion U.S. dollars in its um, foreign currency reserves. That's fairly amazing. I mean, if you think of all the dollars China accumulates because of the trade surplus that they have with the U.S., um, it just made sense if you need to keep something that's basically a risk-free asset. Well, um, they saw what we did to Russia, which is basically say that we are going to impound, disable, uh, make unaccessible all of this uh, currency or all of these securities that you thought were completely liquid. Um, and China presumably does not want to end up in that situation if we ever have a crisis. And this is one of my many gripes about the war, the Russia-Ukraine war and our, our sort of um, unmitigated support for uh, Ukraine, or more importantly, just the, the way we've done sanctions against Russia is that we seem to have played our aces against Russia, uh, demonstrated to China how powerful they could be, or at least how sweeping they could be, even if they're not changing Russian conduct. Um, and now we've sort of given away a weapon. Am I, am I seeing that the right way? Is that what China is doing here? I, I think that's a large part of what they're doing. I think the other thing is they're spending the money. You know, uh, I think they are spending the money to, you know, bailouts and this and that, you know, 50 billion, 30 billion here, 40 billion there. And so they're pulling from reserves. That's one of the things that I was told. Somebody said the other day, they said they, you have to find the corresponding switch into the other currencies. You know what I'm saying? And that's very hard to track. That's very difficult to track. Um, also, you would think that gold or something would also start going up, too, because they, they, they put it there. Um, but. I do think the overall thesis is correct. I think the Chinese looked at what we did in Russia and they've seen it and they're going to move. They also have, quite frankly, many more vulnerabilities than the Russians do. The Russians still have agriculture, natural resources, including gold and, of course, oil. Good. Well, enjoy your time in Taiwan. Hopefully we'll get you a couple more times while you're over there. That's it for this episode of Simon White. But join us again soon. Thanks.